Topping Talks. Hundred and five hours a week, can't be beat. Welcome to Topping Talks. Topping Talks is a Topping Tribune production, and today's episode is proudly sponsored by Topping Technologies and ExpressVPN. Topping Technologies is an IT value-added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He, that's the joke you see. If you're an IT leader or a business owner, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, are you part of the 3.6% of Americans who still care about your privacy? If you are, then perfect. ExpressVPN can exist. Even though 96% of stats are made up on the spot, ExpressVPN does give 100% guarantee via the 30-day back money guarantee. Now, without further ado, I am proud to say today that I'm interviewing Jeff Pressler, who is one of the IT operations managers at one of the most prestigious law firms in DFW. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Jeff. Absolutely, Tommy. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. So winding the clock back a couple of years, what was the first experience that got you kind of interested in IT? Uh, so in IT, I started when I was 18 uh, in IT. I actually was working for a small company, well, not even really technically working for them. Uh, my girlfriend's stepdad was there and uh, he was a DBA for the company and he had been in an accident. It was a small, small company. So if you, if you did one thing, you did all the things. Oh yeah. And so they had, they were doing an IT refresh on all their computers. And so he's like, Hey, I hurt my back at work. I hurt my back. I can't, I can't do this. Can you mind coming up? Just help me unload and unbox these computers. And I was like, yeah. sure, that's totally fine. Well, while I was there, his boss ended up coming over and he's like, Hey, you want to learn, you want to learn how these things actually work? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I don't have another job. Let's do it. Yeah. And so, yeah, that actually got me into uh, the very basics of, of IT work and kind of started off as it was about a 30 person company oh, and, wow. uh, and kind of kind of got to grow up there for a couple of years as they as their sole help desk person. So what kind of computers were they? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, there they had a mix. The ones that I was unloading that day, I think were all compacts. And oh, uh, OG, there you go. Yeah. And so they were, uh, well, they were compacts. They did not yet have Windows 98 on them. Uh, and so that really? was my first, what I thought was programming was yeah. when, you know, going in and actually doing the, you know, copying that Windows directory from the floppy drive onto the C drive and then going yeah. through and, you know, it took me forever to understand that it's okay to uh, pull the floppy out because it's in the loaded in the, in the actual live memory. Yeah. And so, you know, and you have the whole box of your, all of your operating systems on this whole box of floppies and all this. And how many did it come on back in the day? I've uh, seen the pictures on Facebook. It was, gosh, it, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. I want to say it was like 30 floppy disk or something like that. And then just to put the OS on there, just put the OS on. Oh, how long did that take? I mean, it was, yeah, it was probably with copying everything and all that. It was probably about an hour or two just to get everything. And so you're, you're flopping, it's really? like, insert disc 14. Oh, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, then when 98 SE came out and it was on a CD-ROM, it was the craziest thing ever. So you still had to boot off the floppy drive mm. to start the process. To, really? Yeah. So you'd have to create your C windows and then you, but then you could copy everything off of a CD-ROM onto the hard drive, which was yep. this crazy advancement and time saver. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we eventually get to you know, NT in 2000 and then XP and XP, everything came on this, on this disc. And it was yeah. like, man, this is just all in one. We are living in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And now I, you know, I, I went from windows 10 to windows 11 by clicking a button. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how I got my feet wet and started in it and, and doing end, end user customer support type stuff and, and understanding the basics of faxing, printing and all that stuff. What was it like back? I was going to say, I'm probably aging myself a little bit as well, but what was it like? Because at that time, that was before Google was so ridiculously unparalleled and popular. How did you find the answers back then? Oh, you had, you had to know a guy. I mean, you had, <laughs> there, there was, there was typically, it, it was almost like, it feels like we're talking about the middle ages now, but uh, <laughs> you would have like kind of an apprentice mentor relationship with your boss yeah. and your boss would be the guy that he had trained you up on how to do this. And so you learn everything from him and then you figure it out figure out the rest of it on your own, or you go and you find, you know, where's that one file cabinet that has that one Microsoft book in it. And you'll know, go through there, flip through there. No, I'm not getting this error message. No, I'm not. No, went through this, went through this, went through this. And I had an advantage where my, my dad, gosh. as I was growing up, my dad taught me how to work on cars. And oh, of really? course, back in the, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, it was a lot, whole, whole lot easier, a lot simpler oh, yeah. to work on cars then. But that's where I learned how to troubleshoot. You know, mm -hmm. if you know how the process is supposed to work as you're going through there, you can kind of figure out, okay, it's breaking down at step eight. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well then let's go look at what's step eight. Well, it's a distributor cap. Well, there so, you go. This so is probably a problem with the distributor cap. And so I was able to actually take that and apply that to computers and troubleshooting. So as long as I could understand how the process is supposed to work, mm -hmm. then I could go and backtrack and figure out, okay, here's how we fix this. So that, and it's one of those things where it's all about the concepts. As long as you understand the concepts, you can translate them to different industries yep. and 
I was going to say, what kind of cars were you working on back in the day? Uh, I mean, uh, Chevy pickups mostly. There you go. Um, you know, we've got, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a picture of me somewhere actually crawled in under the hood of, of, of my show, of my truck. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's starting out. I had it and I still own the truck and I need to finish, no way. I need to finish rebuilding it. Yeah. It's an 82, uh, Chevy custom deluxe. Nice. How many pedals do you got? Huh? How many pedals you got? Oh, t- well, sorry. There's, there's two. Oh, darn. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. There are two pedals there, but it's actually, uh, so kind of in my teenage years, I was kind of out in the country. And so it was a retired farm truck. Oh, cool. And so someone had taken it at a 350, uh, 350 V8 in it. And then they had a 350 transmission, mm-hmm. which is not the normal transmission. And so there was no overdrive. It was actually more like a towing, tra- towing transmission, but it was an automatic. Mm-hmm. And so it was great for pulling stumps up out of the ground, but oh, yeah, it's going to top out at about 50 miles an hour or so, which oh, really? is probably why my dad was like, yeah, that's a good truck for you. <laughs> You can't get in too much trouble. No, not in theory. <laughs> well, different types of trouble, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I knew a lot of dirt roads. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then what was it like? What was that first official job in IT? Once you got, um, you went from helping out and setting up the PCs and what was the next step? So for me, it was, um, it was, it was interesting because so at the time I was just out of high school, just started going to community college. And so I was only working three days a week because I had classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I would work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I went and that we did that for two years and wow. then I rearranged my schedule when I planned on going to, I went and graduated from UNT, but as I was getting ready to do that, I switched to all night classes so that I could work a normal work schedule in yeah. theory. Uh, but unfortunately about that same time, the company got bought out by a larger company. It was in based out of Florida mm-hmm. and they had this new software that was going to, this really cool software called Microsoft link. And what it seemed like, and this is, you know, as a global company that we now are part of, that was mm-hmm. what they used to communicate and keep things, you know, keep to be able to, to do business transactions live across the departments and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. What that meant for me was that they were able to also do chats with their uh, technical support group, which was overseas. Really? And so, yeah, so my very first IT job, I did lose because I got outsourced to a, to a, to a group overseas. Mm-hmm. And so... That left me in a position where I had now rearranged my life so that and rearranged my college plans and all this stuff so that I could go on full time to them saying, you know what, actually, not only can you not go on full time, but you also you can't stay on part time either. Really? Yeah. Oh, and man. so that was but that was my first two years of IT career. And then I worked from went from there to, to working in a factory for about six months. And then I ended oh, really? up getting a yeah, that, yeah, building ovens in uh, out of a cup for a company in uh, in downtown Dallas. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's, it, it was interesting. You know, I, I it it. I learned a lot from there as far as processing goes because you're working on an assembly line. Yeah. And so I actually use that a lot today when referencing is like, you know, you need to understand the why. Why is it so important that this screw gets tightened and these three screws do not get tightened? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to know that because at the next step, they need those three, those three screws loosened because the next person on the line has to be able to make an adjustment. But if you don't know that why, then you're just going to kind of just do it all, throw it all together and you're going to push it on down the line and something else is going to break down. So it's very important when we talk about processes and that you, you understand the why behind what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And so then, so I left there about six months later, I left there and I went to work for a bank and uh, just got into help desk and then kind of worked my way up to desktop support. And then eventually moved over to our infrastructure team, which where I became a VMware guy. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, uh, it was a fun time because I always talk about like September 8th is uh, uh, September 8th, 2008 is my first, was my very first day as a VMware admin. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll never forget it. And I always bring it up too, because, um, we had in our, in our, uh, data center or server room there, we had all of our, uh, production systems and all these racks. We had about five or six racks of production systems. And then we had this oh, wow. one, one rack of our dev environment. Mm. And typically a lot of times, even still today, you, people look at dev and DR and all this is just kind of a secondary, like it's secondary priority. We don't think about it much, but in reality, yeah. in that case, we were paying or the, the bank I was working for was paying a lot of money for this user provisioning process because we had 15 different applications we had, and we needed a way for, to kind of automate that creation of users across all these different applications and set up everything as we're, as we're bringing people on and growing quickly. Yeah. And also we were a bank. And so there are a lot of our folks on the front lines, we kind of had a little bit of a turnover. And so we needed to be able to make this go happen as fast as possible. Makes sense. So we've got, I don't want to, I don't know. I can't say the exact dollar figure, but I'm pretty sure it was over a million dollars to have invested into this system that was only in the dev environment. So it was only living in this dev rack. Oh, wow. Well, somebody noted that server rooms feeling a little bit, a little bit hot, you know, Maybe something's going on with the cooling system. We'll check into that till now. Let me plug a fan in and we'll, we'll get the place cooled down. Right. So they plug, they plug a fan in, they walk out five o'clock uh, hits. 
we start getting alerts and someone calls and says, hey, the developers can't get into the systems. Can you go check them? I'm like, yeah, sure, that's fine. It's weird, but okay. And so we go to check it and turns out that the entire dev rack had lost power. No. And yeah, <laughs> and so we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to troubleshoot and we're going, and, and I'm, I'm the new guy. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep my mouth shut and just be behind everybody. Yeah. And, and so um, we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on? Well, I mean, it's got power. Oh, a breaker tripped. That's weird. Okay, well, flip it back. Cool. Five minutes later, drops mm -hmm. power again. Yeah. So after three rounds of this, Great. we finally said, hey, what's changed in yeah. the environment? Someone plugged a fan into the power strip. Oh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and unplug the fan. We start to bring it up, and the uh, it was a Dell, the SAN that we had, all the storage for, yeah. was, this, was this Dell system. I forget the model. But because it had not been able to successfully boot three times, it lost its RAID configuration. Really? So all the storage is just gone. It's just gone. Like, we had to start oh over gosh. from scratch. Yeah, it was, no. it, was, it was like one of those times that somebody looks at me, and they're like, um, oh hey, VMware guy, yeah. we have 120 VMs that need to be recreated. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And so my first, thankfully, we had we had backups. Of course, they're all on tape, but we had backups. But you had them. That's, we had them. That was that's the, that's the, the important part. And, yeah. and they were tested, so they, they were real. Yes. That's that. the big question. Because <laughs> everyone always goes, they're like insurance. I got insurance. Great. I have backups. Great. But have you ever tested the backups? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, Maybe last year. I, the, the job said it was successful, so we just take it at that. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do that. You really no. go to test stuff. Well, <laughs> this became a very, very um, real test mm -hmm. because I spent 28 hours that my first day. It was 28 straight hours of rebuilding 120 VM shells. Jeez. So that we could, then my backup guy could come and he had, get, he had to go to where we kept all the tapes off site and gather yeah. up all the tapes and everything. Cause he had already picked them up from that, more, you know, the previous night's backup had already been set off site. Yeah. So he went and gathered up all the tapes. And as I'm building these shells out and naming them and setting our IP information, getting all this stuff. And then he's taken over from there and adding the backup agent, which was semantic backup exec back then. Oh, wow. And, um, and so he would then re do a bare metal restore essentially on this, on the VMs. And so it took us all night long, obviously, yeah. but we got the dev system back up. But that was like my first day as a VMware admin. Oh and it was like one of those times where it's like, man, this sounded really cool, guys. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How, but how do you stay awake? Coffee? Do they even have energy drinks back then? Or how do you do that? We, we, <laughs> I, I, I'm allowed sure, to say. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no. yeah, they just kept giving us amphetamines. No, that's just not. No, we don't do that. I no. mean, uh, it was, you know, it was definitely a coffee driven uh, yeah. a, a adventure, but we had such great leadership that our CIO, our VP, our director, everybody, if there was one of us working on an emergency, everybody was there. What that's can I get you? Can I get you dinner? Do you need dinner? Excellent. Hey, can you take, do you need to take a break? Do you want to just go walk around for a minute? Why, yeah. don't, you, why don't you go get some fresh air? You know, I see, I see your, I see your, you're really pushing hard on this. Um, I want to make sure you're working efficiently. Yep. Let's are, 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 what, what can I do to help with that? And these were guys that probably knew the technology enough to where they could have stepped in and just worked their way through it as well. Mm -hmm. But it really meant like that was, that was a real big moment for me. When I think about like, if I, if I ever get into leadership, this is the kind of person that I want to be as someone yeah. that, you know, I may not be able to tell you exactly the program or the command to, the, to fix this. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to make sure that you have as a, you have what you need as a human being to be able to get this job done efficiently. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's that was that was really what I remember the most. I mean, I'm sure there was probably a gallon of coffee in my system. Oh too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the part that really stuck out to me the most. Well, that's also how you could truly test leadership and know how leaders are going to act under the pressure. How are they going to react to that situation? Are they going to get angry? Get irate? Are they going to blame someone? Or are they going to support the team and do what it takes to actually get the company back online? Yeah. Yeah, and thankfully we we definitely had a really great group, and 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 I still keep in touch with those guys today. I mean, I haven't worked with them in twenty years now, but yeah. but I still I still we still have gatherings, you know, once every couple of years, and we still text it, hey, happy birthday, well, oh, yeah. thanks, man, I haven't seen you in eighteen years, but it's good, you know, it's good to know that you're still there, and and yeah, that that's how you build really great relationships. I think is just being there and keeping a calm head in the crisis, and let's just let's just focus on what we need to do to get this situation back to normal. It's also one of those difficult things, like. Being a mentor and and actually being a mentee is you're going to learn the most when you're put under pressure and you're not given the answer. You have to fight to find the answer and accomplish the task. Where the easy button would be, they just tell you or they show you. Yeah, but that is one of those tricky situations. But that's when you grow the most is when you're put in those situations and they say, "Hey, I'm going to give you the tools to get the job done, but it's up to you to figure out how to get it done. Go at it. Yeah, let's see what let's see what you can do. Yep." 
And hopefully, was this, hopefully, maybe, did it happen on a Friday? No. <laughs> oh, no. Is it the war, like Monday morning? I, like I don't know. There were so many <laughs> times where um, we, we would always joke about, like, everybody at 3 p.m. on Fridays, everybody walk away from your desk. <laughs> like, we're all, we're all just going to ride the clock until 5, and nobody's touching anything. No changes. Uh, yeah, no yep. changes. Because sometimes there was that, you know, I that that really well intended i think this would be more efficient if we did this oh yeah <laughs> okay yeah and then sunday night we're all still there like hating each other and you know oh, trying yeah. to figure out how do we get the business functional <laughs> by opening um but yeah there there was that that's another thing that now has has really played into where i am today career wise is like i really respect a change control process Oh, absolutely. Because like, this is how we get, this is how we avoid stuff like that. Oh yeah. And the, the biggest pressure is if the business is down for a minute, well, the, the aggregate adds up to all the hundreds of employees, oh, yeah. all the customers. I mean, yep. all the pressure really starts to mount when you realize, oh dear God, the ripple effect or the domino effect with IT. Yeah. I mean, big risk, big reward. You can enable your end users to make their lives ridiculously easy and also hopefully secure. Or it could be a pretty big, a uh, little bit of trouble to have to troubleshoot with. Yeah, absolutely. The <laughs> law firm that I work with today, the director of operations, like I think it was either the first or second day that I was there, I'm riding up the elevator with this guy, really friendly fella, really nice guy. Uh, but he says his basic like pep talk is, hey, I just want you to understand that if we take a system down, we bill in six minute increments. And if we take a system down, then it's down for six minutes. This is the dollar figure that that has cost us. Oh, yeah. And it was like, that was my message walking in the door. And I was like, oh, be yeah. aware. Yeah, I got you. Yep. I got you. Don't make changes uh, yeah. on Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're going to do a great job as so long as you don't screw it up. Exactly. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> got it. If you do screw up and you think it's not a big deal, here's the fiscal, how it is yeah. a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And it adds up because lawyers ain't cheap. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's always, that's, that was also the joke because the next, the, that conversation then evolved into how much do you make a year versus <laughs> how much you would cost us? Yeah. Like, yeah, we, you know, be, walk, walk carefully. You know, exactly. Just, Be like, well, now that you mentioned that, I provide a heck of a lot of value keeping all this up and running successfully and securely. Yeah, I, I wasn't in a, that that type of negotiating oh, position, but yeah, I, but yeah, I, I, it's it's a good point. It's something to really consider and to think about too. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And then when after you had become the VMware, and you, where did you go after that job? So with when I so I took over VMware and then we had this um, we had a transition kind of in, in a little bit of in leadership but also uh, just kind of times we had a, we had a couple of our top leaders that ended up moving to another company mm -hmm. and then they kind of did the 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 the, the kind of the good old boy thing and say hey you know I've got a position open over here yep. and so yeah so a few of us ended up following them which I think is is probably a pretty high praise if you're willing to to, oh, to leave it. A, a, yeah you know, fairly stable environment to follow somebody. Absolutely. And so, but I followed them over to, uh, from the bank, I went over and worked for uh, Gold's Gym. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah, I worked out for Gold's Gym and uh, for- is that, is that pun? That was, I was trying <laughs> to take it, it in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I worked for them for about four and a half years and then they, wow. and they are owned by, uh, at the time they were owned by a company called TRT Holdings and who also owned Omni Hotels and a few oh, other, yeah. and a few other uh, companies as well. And um, they're German now, though, unfortunately, they're not no longer TRT Holdings. They spun it off during COVID. Oh, so I didn't know. I haven't been keeping up. I haven't been keeping up with the company, but I've been keeping up with the majority of the team that, that yeah. I was a part of there. Um, but uh, again, another great place where you have really cool culture uh, oh, yeah. and really, really great, great folks that you're working with. And it's just kind of, you know, a lot of times I personally like to just say, look, I'm here to keep the lights on. I don't care who gets credit for something. I just need to know that, that we're doing what we need to do. Exactly. And there were so many folks there that, that kind of had that same mentality of, look, I don't, I don't need to have my name in lights. I yep. just want to make sure that this job is getting done and that we're doing it right. And so, uh, but when I went there, it was a big transition for me because I went from being the VMware guy. Now, as people were leaving and going other places from the bank, um, I also became the backup guy. And then yep. I also became this guy <laughs> and then that guy. And that a lot guy. of hats. Yeah, a lot of hats. Yep. And so when I went to Gold's, uh, I had a lot of new hats. And so like yeah. my official title was systems administrator of telecommunications. And I was like, do we have to pay like for business cards by the letter? Because that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and we, I, we don't, please don't do that. That's going to be a lot. And, and, but um, yeah, so I became officially the phone guy, but I was also the email guy, the backup guy, this guy, that guy. Oh my gosh. What, and, was, what was it like for all those sites? Cause a lot of people don't, may or may not realize goals. Gym is mostly owned by the company. It's not a franchise model, I believe. 
And there's a lot of sites throughout the U.S. So that's kind of gone back and forth over the years. Yeah, like when a- I first got there, there were 62 of the, so there were roughly 700 locations of Gold's Gem, 62 of which were corporately owned. Oh, really? Yeah, so the majority of them were franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when I left, there were about 125, I think, corporately owned locations. And those were either completely new construction, new sites, mm-hmm. um, or some of those were sites that were franchise locations that were bought at, that were bought into, or some of them were a totally different brand that was going to be shutting the doors. And so we just took over the space. Yeah. Um, and so, but we saw really, really cool growth there, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, it was, it was, it was, there was a lot of hats and a lot of things going on and, and, and so you're constantly learning. And so that's where I started learning more about telecom and, 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 um, and previously all of my experience on telecommunications and telephones is, uh, you know, I don't know if you know what a 33 block is or a 66 block or 110 punch tool. Uh, explain for my parents on the line. Or, oh, okay. Or sure. in. <laughs> Your parents might know actually. Yeah. Um, so where you would, you would end up having, um, these, these really big long blocks that are just full of tabs, um, that are, that's, that your phone line is then routed to. And then you would have a small copper wire that you would make little jumpers over from one spot to another. And so typically the way it works is there's, there's four, uh, rows of tabs and for a telecom line you need at least two wires and so uh, they would come on the provider side they would be on the left your left two prongs or your positive and negative for your provider and then your right two prongs are your positive and negative for your office space and so like your this phone number is coming in on this set of prongs and so if the so if topping wants to move from this office and this space in the building to this uh, this other office we're literally going to go unpull those wires oh geez and then make a new jumper from this fixed point on the left side to wherever the destination point on the right side is and oh, so geez. <laughs> yeah so it was a very analog system I mean, that's how that's how it worked and so that was basically all my exposure to phone systems and how we how we handled that um, moving into golds, we had an Avaya IP office system. And oh, so, nice. yeah, so it was all yo G. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, when I worked well, at my first job in IT was inside sales at Hewlett Packard enterprise. And at the very first telecom we had, we had was the physical Avaya phones with the ethernet and plug in. Mm-hmm. And I was faster than the devil pushed those buttons. I like the physical phone. I know they went virtual later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're definitely virtual now. Well, and we, and we, so we ended up, we, we had that, we had the IP office and we had the Avaya uh, phones and they were, they were, SIP technology esque, you know, I mean, they were, they were functioning off of SIP, but in reality it was all coming off of either analog trunks or a PRI or something that is maybe digital, but not really fully SIP yet. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we started off there and that's where I learned about, started learning about phone systems. And then we got to do a little bit of kind of crossover projects with Omni hotels and, and like I went into to Omni's headquarters and this was gosh, in 2000, I want to say like 2010, or 2008, 2010, somewhere in there. And I walked into Omni, Omni, Omni's uh, corporate headquarters and I'm talking to some of the folks there and they're like, well, here, let me show you our phone system. Mm-hmm. And they had a Toshiba, uh, like mechanical, like you could, you could walk in, you could hear the clicks as really? people were dialing. Yeah. No. It was just this craziest thing. So we went from there <laughs> and then they go to, they went, and this one of my last projects with that group was, uh, we, we put in a short tail system. Oh yeah. And Shortel is really, it's a really cool technology and really liked it. And, and it was, it was our first really fully SIP solution that, that we did and, and working with, uh, with AT&T on the, on the provider side and, um, really cool that it always cracked me up though, or always felt like kind of like facepalm moment was Shortel's tag was brilliantly simple. So whenever you're struggling to figure out why something isn't working and then you keep seeing it's brilliantly simple. I'm like, I'm brilliantly stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Marking matters. Yeah, guys. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Well, those things are darn near bulletproof. Like some of the solutions, like it's been decades and they still, I see them in the environments like they're still running. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I think phones are, are really one of those things. It's the, probably the hardest thing to sell to folks because they've had the same phone on their desk for 20 years. It still works. The physical device people like. What, what breaks down on it? Well, the stand, like, Uh, like when you have someone that slams it down, the stand, the physical plastic stand, like everything else just works. And, and so I, I see where, whenever we're talking about transitioning, like we, we did at the law firm, we transitioned from there to a, to a full VoIP solution. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was like, well, well, why do we need to do this? Well, yep. because it's it's costing more to maintain this old thing than it is going to be oh, to yeah. get you a lot of new cool new features yep. or features. And you know, okay, fine, but is it going to look the same? No, 
<laughs> no, no. The thing I put on your desk in 2004 is yes. not going to look like the same thing in 2020. Yeah, you know, or, or sorry, two, you know, 2022 or whenever it is that we actually finished it. Um, but yeah, it's it's it's. I learned a lot about kind of the mechanics in there, and like where we go and kind of always, like I said, I always go back to, to working on a truck. You know, figuring yep. out that process. And when I had to learn SIP SIP technologies and the, the, the signaling and everything involved, like it just it it made sense to me, and then I and I was able to troubleshoot that. That's another important point is you can have the best technology, the best solution in the world, but most important thing, what's the end user's thoughts? Is it going to make their life easier? Got to you know, show them how, so they're going to save the company money, or maybe they'll have some features you didn't know you have and that you actually want. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, with phones, I mean, you go to Walmart, they still have those Cisco phones from like 20, 30 years ago because they just work. Yeah. They're darn near bulletproof. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk, we can talk more about that one time. <laughs> some I have a funny um that, that's always the, the funny thing. Like you walk into Walmart and like the, we always go over to like the sporting desk, you know, to, to buy a hunting license or oh, whatever. Yeah. I see and, that phone right there. Yeah. The phone's sitting right there. And I'm like, man, I know the, I know the extension to dial to get onto the intercom. I can find my own person to help me out here, <laughs> but I don't. Oh, well, they got, it helps when they have it taped there too. It's, right it's like, there. Oh, yeah. it's written. Yeah. Right yeah. next to the IBM cash register. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, some technologies just built to last. Well, that was, yeah. I mean, we had the, we had, you talk about POS technology stuff, you know, the, the receipt printer is connected to the drawer, to the cash drawer via a phone cord. Yeah. You know, and it's like, <laughs> man, that's really not a tricky signal to actually get it to eject that. And you know, when you, when yeah. you know that technology <laughs> and you're like, man, when, especially, and I think this may just be like an IT nerd thing for me, but like whenever yeah. I'm going to buy something and they're like, oh, it's just not working. And I'm like, have you tried just doing, doing this? Yeah. Oh, well, I can't do that. Well, I'm just saying, you know, you could try it and uh, maybe it'll work. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but <laughs> please don't think I'm going to rob you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's but. like, I'm, I'm always, uh, I like to play I Spy when I go to every building big, because my background, before I started the, my own company, actually, I was a field rep for Aruba Networks and like, they just trained us to always look at the ceiling and be like, see what competition or see if they use our access points already. So I'm always playing your iSpy, like, I have access points that got in here for Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always love when I, you pull up to a, to a, uh, like a fast food drive through place or something and you see on the screen and it's like, oh, that's a Windows 7 error. Why, oh, why, yeah. is, that, <laughs> why is that still there? <laughs> oh, exactly. It's like, oh, the stuff you see in the real world is sometimes scary. Or like, you know, you go to the store, it's like, oh yeah, they have a computer for an employee. It's like, do I see an admin, admin sticky note on there for oh, credentials? Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I do. And the craziest thing was, this is on Facebook, they censored the name of the company, but it was a laminated piece of paper on the computer screen that said username, admin, password, admin. I'm like, oh, dear God. Yeah. Have they ever had an external test or any security test? And kind of like backups. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they just didn't read the report. But yeah, sometimes the things you find are pretty entertaining and scary to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> definitely. If you're an IT guy out there, you need to understand SNMP community strings. If oh, something yeah. in your environment is still using public, you need to fix that. A ASAP. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And then where did you go from that second company? So from there, I went on to actually join the law firm that I'm, that I'm at now. And I've been here for a little over 10 years. Uh, I came on as the phone guy. Um, there you go. What were they using back in the day? So we started off there. And this is uh, the only time I've ever been lied to at the law firm is when they said Cisco system. It's not a complicated thing. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, we have a Cisco phone system there, a Cisco uh, Cisco Unified Communications, a call, call center, or call, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. as a call or call manager, I think is what, what it used to be called. But um, we ran it for several years, kept updating it as needed. But and, and Cisco, so CUCM is really great at scaling. Oh, like yeah. It's got a great model for scaling. It's the same pyramid model. Every sys, every sys doc in there is going to have the same pyramid model in there. And so it's really great for scaling. But it was kind of overkill for us. And yeah. so there was just a lot. I mean, 80-20 rule didn't even scratch the surface on how we were not using that thing. Oh, really? Yeah. And so, but it, but it was a really, it, once you kind of understood it and you had you understood routing partitions and, and, and permissions and then accounting side of it, and, and once you got all of that, it, it made sense. And it yeah. wasn't easy to work on system. But, you know, when you've got five pages of setup for one single for one single user when they come in, you know, it's like, I, I think we could probably simplify this even more. Yeah. Um, and so we over the over the years, we've transitioned away from that. And so we're no longer using the Cisco phone system, uh, but we are but we are still using quite a bit of, of you know, other technology that's still there. But we, you know, we keep upgrading. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's kind of the that's where we talk when we talk about infrastructure, we talk about. Uh, the technologies that we're using, you know, the 
the the big thing that always comes up is the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things. Oh yeah, buzzwords. You, you know, <laughs> are, yeah, are you are are you ready for this? Are you ready for that? Well, yeah. it doesn't matter if you're ready for it or not. It's out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you really got to look back at it and say, Am I doing this? And I'm and I'm and am I doing this correctly? Am I doing it securely? Yes. And so one of the reasons why we got away from the Cisco phone system is we weren't really keeping up with security updates as well as we should have. Oh. And so thankfully there was not an issue. Like there wasn't an incident that told us that it's just something that we knew. Like we were doing our own internal audits of saying, Hey, you know what, if, you know, this is comes into a lot and I'm sure you're familiar too from the IT security world is if I wanted to get in, how would I do it? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and so you start, you start looking at it and like, man, this phone system sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got, we got, it. and it's not that it's a bad product. It's just, it's not, you got to manage your products oh, yeah. well. And so, uh, and so we weren't managing it that well as far as keeping it up to date and all of that. And so, uh, and so we got it as far as it could go before we had to do it like a full hardware refresh. And we're like, okay, now we're here. Oh, yeah. Let's see what our options are. And so we ended up making a transition to a different system that we're on today that's working out really well and a whole lot easier to keep up to date. Oh, yeah. Uh, but um, so that was that's where I, I kind of came into there. And, and um, you know, just over the time, people come, people go and people join the people join the, the company and leave the company. And so I've kind of I've stayed there and, and just kind of kept my nose to the grindstone as best I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, about a year ago, I went from being a systems engineer to Uh, becoming the IT operations manager. And so we combined, um, the way we talk about it is we have, um, I look at it like a restaurant, like our help desk and our end user services are the front front of the restaurant. And then our operations, the, uh, all the back end stuff, that's the kitchen. And so um, I am, I am now the manager for the kitchen. And so that I'm the first line of support for the application specialist for the backup specialist for the for the the senior engineer for all those folks in the same way that my counterpart the manager for the tech support group mm. you know she's the first line of support for for her team and making sure that the end users are getting taken care of that what was it like getting that transition to get that promotion was there certain things you had to do or is there any advice to youngsters listening or folks who are trying to get that big because that's one of the biggest hurdles in it is how do you go from that that big promotion because sometimes it takes time. There's certain metrics. It, there's a, a lot of variables that go into that. Like that's what I hear. There's a feedback on the show. People are wondering how could I apply some lessons learned maybe from Jeff to my life. Yeah. So I mean, I would say it, it's definitely a, it's definitely a, a, a big transition uh, because you go from being the person that is Johnny on the spot to solve problems to being the person that's finding Johnny and giving him the problem to solve. Yep. Uh, but as far as that transition, you know, my my biggest advice. First off, always assume you're going to be learning. So never shy away from learning something. You're always you're always going to want to be growing. In the same way that IT is always evolving, all the IT people need to be evolving as well. So you always want to be learning. You know, volunteer, take on stuff. Don't don't shy away from learning something new and 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 and, and developing those new skills. And so and and you know, I hate to say it, but show up. Like yeah. that's that's a that's a big part of it. Not just being at work on time. That's obviously important, but also you know, being present in a conversation, make sure that, that when you see something that needs to be addressed, that you say, Hey, we need to, you know, let's, I may not have a plan for it. I may not have all the solutions for it, but we need, we probably need to get this on our radar because this is something that's concerning. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I don't know that that's the way that I've gotten a promotion or that, that it's worked out for me, but I know that, um, I have a really open line of communication with my leadership and they know that I am, that I am keeping an eye on things. And sometimes that means bringing up something that seems really random, but it's actually very important for the, for the group. Absolutely. So I, I was going to say, I'm a little, a little bit of an old soul. If you, you probably you already know yeah, me, yeah, me, but it's, that, it's yeah. one of those things where I truly <laughs> think that it is again, it kind of, it's hard if you work from home, but just getting to the work a half hour or an hour early and staying a half hour or an hour late, even if you're doing the same productivity level as everyone else around you, you're going to stand out because you're putting in the effort. You're going above and beyond. Yeah. Which these days is pretty easy to stand out just on average when you see in the workforce. But a lot of times it is. Yeah. One of the things that one of my first IT managers told me, the, the my prob, I think probably my most important advice ever given to me was you never want to become the guy that management is cringes when you go talk to the end user. Yes. You know, customer service, being a human with someone else, which, which you know, <laughs> keep it in anyway, it. And I spent years on help desk side and, and answering those questions. Oh, and, yeah. you know, you're not getting someone on their best day. Like understand going into it that you are not, someone's already having a rough time when they start having a conversation with you. So if you're having a bad day and that comes across to them, that's not going to make their day any better. And that's not going to make them want to work with you any easier. 
And so, you know, you always want to make sure that your interpersonal skills are not always, you know, you don't always have to be Prince Charming. You don't always have to be um, the yes man. You don't have to always do that. But just make sure that people understand that they're talking to another human being and that you know you're talking to another human being. Because um, I know a lot of folks over my career, and I know that I've probably been that guy at the time where, uh, yeah, it's you may just want that person to to work in the office or in the in the closet in the back. You know, <laughs> yeah. they they they're going to feel better talking to the computers. You know, understand those people's about those folks' values and under and 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 let them do that when that works for them. Yeah. Uh, but just never become the guy that when the phone rings and you're like, please don't let it be him. Please don't let it be him. Please don't let it be him. Yep. You know, because that's just, that's, that's gonna, that's gonna spill over and that's going to be a kind of a career limiting attitude. Oh, I absolutely agree. I mean, some of those brilliant people I know, they, even if, you know, you give them positive feedback and I hope, you know, with reading and training, they do overcome the obstacles, but there's some people I know where they have the most brilliant minds and they just sharpen their interpersonal skills. Yeah, they'd be able to excel the career exponentially. And I, I truly believe, again, if I was president or dictator for a day, I'd say everyone in America should work customer service and help desk for a couple of days. Yeah, because you'll build character and you'll get to see the other side of the equation, because it is true when someone's dialing in for, you know, for help desk, they're already frustrated because, again, not it's just we all have certain roles at a job. We all have certain hats that we wear. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be an IT guru or a tech person. Yeah. They might be it might be a lawyer where they are sharp as a tack. They know all the laws around right. a very specific topic, but they don't know how to do some type of fix on their computer. Yeah. So they're calling in, they're already upset. They don't want to feel, no, no one wants to feel dumb. Yeah. So they already don't feel great. And if you talk down on them or take, I mean, it's going to kneecap your career in the long term. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. It really is just treat everyone the same, treat everyone like they're almost like a family member in a good way. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, <laughs> You know, tell them, hey, you know, don't worry. And just let them know, like, don't worry. I've heard dumber questions. I like to make a joke, be like, trust me, I've asked more dumb questions you can never even comprehend. Yeah. So let me know what's happening on, on your end and how can the team and I help you out? Yeah. But it is really true. Just go on help desk for a couple of days, do customer service for a day, and you'll, people build some character. And that's what I, I think a lot of people are lacking on average these days. And I think it makes you a better person. Well, in IT too, we, I think a lot of us consider being on help desk is kind of like paying your dues. Like you're, oh, yeah. you're, you need to, you need to be able to uh, be relatable. You need to be able to relate to person because also when you're in the back end stuff, like, like what I've done the majority of my career now, mm -hmm. like your first customer is the help desk. They're Absolutely. the people that are, you know, understand when you're, when someone is calling you or they're escalating something to you, that means that they have tried everything they know. Exactly. They're at their wits end mm -hmm. and they need someone that can come in and solve this problem. Exactly. And it may or may not be a technological issue. Like it may not be an account that's locked out or some yeah. DNS issue or something like that. It may actually be just a process. You know, it's a user error that yeah. happens. The human but, error is real. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but we, and we need to make sure that we are, uh, you're always respectful of that and you're always mindful of that. You know, remember that we are dealing with, dealing with other human yeah. beings. They're your, right? they're your customers. You guys sell them on the idea, sell them on the tech, tell them, gotta explain to them, like, especially for IT security these days. I mean, the end user is one of the biggest targets. You have to let them know, like, here's the downtime cost. Like here's, here's why we want you and I to learn together so we can understand the real risks that are out there that you might not think, cause we're not a fortune 100 company, but I can assure you everyone is a target these days. Yep. So that's why you need to really sell the messaging and translate the IT to just average, uh, average, just conversational talk, mm -hmm. just make it more relatable and make it more comprehensible for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, you know, it's kind of, uh, try not to go too, too far off on this tangent, but like when we talk about we're all targets, um, I was talking, I was at a, um, as an FBI event a few years ago and the director of the Dallas office was there talking and he said, uh, he, he kind of put something into perspective for, for me and hopefully everyone else in the room. Uh, but he said, if you're in an accident on the highway, you know, and, and someone sideswipes you, they run they rear end you, whatever, that's an accident. Things happen. Okay understand that you, you're going to get frustrated, but you know, it's, it was an accident. It's, it's, it happens. If you're on the internet, if someone attacks you or you get something, something doing a port scan on your firewall, that means that they had to put in your IP address. Mm -hmm. This isn't, they're not just out there cruising down the information highway. Like that doesn't, and they just bumped into your firewall like that. They are specifically going after your IP address. They're, tr this is a targeted thing. And this is where I think a lot of folks don't, don't realize where they, when we talk about, you know, we had, you know, 10,000 intrusion attempts in the last three months or something. We're like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. But like, no, I need you to understand we yeah. had that, like yeah. that we became the target of that. And so mm -hmm. that is why we are constantly and always trying to improve our security posture. 
you know, there is no, uh, there is no like peak or, or uh, goal that we're going to get to, to say, ah, we've reached it. Our security is perfect. It's not going to happen. It's not possible. No, as, it's, as it's much not. as sales reps will try to say, oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, here's, here's my widget. If you buy it, you're secure. I'm like, well, first of all, you're full of crap because <laughs> yeah. no, there's no such thing. You could become more secure. Yes. Yeah. And I always tell people, you just want to kind of hedge your bets or build, you know, get the odds in your favor. You could build up walls around your castle. And I would always tell people with security, you want to make it so that you're not an easy target. The enemy, the malicious actor, you want to make it so they have to put such a disproportional amount of effort into going after you. They're just going to go on to the next company because yep. they might still have a password password. Well, they might and, have something simple to break yeah, into. And understand that the bad guys are a business too. Oh and yeah. So they've got to analyze their return on investment. And if they yep. are spending hours and hours and hours not getting anywhere, yeah, they're going to come on. They're going to go on to the next one. And so your mm -hmm. goal is to become that target that just isn't worth it. Exactly. You don't want to be soft target. And yep. sometimes though, this is why I'm always advocate. Well, Self, well, I was gonna say a little selfishly. I was gonna say pen tests externally, internally. Do them frequently and do them. Do different people. Don't just use one company because every resource, every company is going to come at it from a different attempt. It's the ultimate cat and mouse game. Yep. Because no two humans are the same, and there are always holes. You just gotta find out where are the holes in the system. How can we bolster our security? Because yeah, you don't want to be the easy target. And it's astonishing. There are some people who still have admin, admin access. It's like, it, and again, it's just like going to the gym or testing backups. If you don't test it, you don't know. Yep. But yeah, I mean, now you can get ransomware as a service. I mean, it's astonishing how much it's growing. And once they get to quantum computing, I mean, the threats are just growing exponentially. I mean, back in the day, it used to be the firewall. That was the most important thing. Nowadays, the firewall has gotten so strong, you have to have a disproportional amount of resources for computing to break through it if you want to go that route of attack. Yeah. So now they're not, on average, again, get a good firewall, obviously. But on average, that's not the main threat vector. It's always evolving. It's always going around, which is why... I find IT security especially so fascinating when, I mean, servers, they get faster, like smartphones, they get faster, more efficient, but there's not a lot of startups in the server community. I can't think of any, but yeah. cybersecurity, you can't go two minutes without a new one with the new technology because it's just the ever evolving Rubik's Cube of IT. Yep. Well, and, you know, and we talk about now like the big marketing thing, or it seems like, it, and I don't think it's just a trend, but the big, t the big tagline, everyone's talking about AI. Oh yes, we've got AI in this tool. <laughs> we've got AI built in here. Talk, let's, let's talk about how our AI analytics says this. And, and so there, there is a valid, you know, and then you have like the Uber nerds that are like, well, it's not really artificial intelligence until it's fully sentient. So that's so quick calling it AI. Yeah. No, it's, it's a lot closer than it used to be. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, so, especially the stuff we're allowed to know about. I mean, yeah. let, let's be honest. It probably is already somewhere in a secure environment, but no yeah, less. I mean, yeah. I, I absolutely love chat GPT. Now I'm only using three, five, cause I'm not going to pay $20 a month for four. Oh, but oh, I, yeah. I imagine four O's got some pretty cool stuff that, that I would eventually like to play with. Oh, it's astonishingly advanced. Oh yeah. I, I can, well, and I was, I was having a really good conversation with my wife about this she's a sixth grade social studies teacher and we have or i've been showing her ways of using uh chad gpt specifically in helping building out lesson plans just coming up with really? ideas and a lot of times and i think this is kind of just a human condition thing once you get so stressed and you have so many you know deadlines and your schedule's so crazy one of the first parts of your brain that kind of shuts down is your creativity mode mm -hmm. and so you've got to be able to free up some bandwidth mentally to be able to to be creative and to come up with these great ideas mm -hmm. And what I was talking to her about, I was like, well, you know, what you can do, even if you're not having chat GPT, like fully write your lesson plans or fully plan your day or something, uh, you can use it in the same way that I look at a cookbook yeah. and I look at all these recipes and all these ideas. And I may not follow this recipe exactly because I may actually want some turmeric in there, or I may want to throw some paprika on that yeah. or something, you know, and, but I use it like a framework yeah. to, for, for something I'm going to cook. I'm like, well, you can use chat GPT to help lay some foundations to allow you to be creative on top of that. And once the foundation is built out, then, you know, then it helps out. It frees up your mind so much to where you can be creative because you want to be that cool and exciting teacher, which she is, um, you know, whether she, whether she always acknowledges it or not, but, but we have to look at AI specifically as how can we actually use that to up the game? Mm -hmm. And I promise we're going to get back to cybersecurity. Here oh, in I like a it. second. But one of the one of the best things that I was watching this interview where this person was talking about AI and then you know the whole concept or the or the controversy around you know well are students going to be using AI to write their exam to write their um, their essays and stuff? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, sure. But and be so, yeah, sorry, so well, so the question is, so do we do we say no, don't do that? We're not going to allow you to do. We're not going to accept this work. Or do we turn around and say yes, have AI, have Jet Chat GPT write the essay? You print it out, bring it to class, and let's critique Chat GPT and see how this could have been done better. Mm -hmm. 
And so we use it instead of just using it as a, or fearing it as a potential crutch, we then use it as a, as a, as a, uh, an actual tool, you know, think about like the TI calculator, Oh yeah. you know, calculus became, went from something that we were, you know, really only mathematicians were dealing with it, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, and folks like in the space program, we're actually dealing with it. And we're now every high school kid is learning the basics of it and is is able to, to, to do calculus because they've got a tool there. It didn't mean, you know, and, and I, they didn't lose the knowledge. They just gained. Yeah, you didn't lose the knowledge. You just you just got better at it. Yeah, you have a new tool. But just like the slide roll, which perhaps I'm aging myself again. But yeah, it used to be you had a slide roll, and that was the neatest technology on the planet. Mm-hmm. Then I believe it was Hewlett Packard was a, or Texas Instruments. One of the two came out the the first mass produced calculator that changed the game. But again, it just says okay, now we have to talk about the concepts more, and that will do the computing for you. Yeah, it just enable you. It was, I yeah, remember it, even when I was a kid, they had a, I think it was Blackboard. There's a software where if you wrote a paper, you'd upload it to this uh, website when I was in high school. It would check it to see if it had been copied by someone else. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And at the time, that's revolutionary. I suspect with AI, not only will, you know, ChatGPT can write a paper, but there's also going to be a tool to detect, was it written by AI? Yeah. Kind of like AI images, and they'll eventually have the technology. Yeah, you, detect should, you, should it as look well. in, you should look into that one right there because there's actually a case, um, I believe, out of a university here in Texas that where a professor when to check that, but unfortunately mm-hmm. didn't really understand the tool he was using. If I, if I, if I'm understanding it correctly and I may be off the wall on this, but I think he, if I remember right, he copied it into the chat and said, Hey, did you write this? Or is this in your, in your memory or something? And of course it says, yes, you know, you just uploaded it, but oh, geez. <laughs> and, and it's like, Oh my gosh, they must've done it. And da, 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 da. You know, that's, um, and so we have to understand the tools that we, that we are using, but when we take that, we need to figure out how do we actually apply it? And a lot of companies now are packaging and selling, here's how to make your work more efficient using, using AI. Mm-hmm. And I was just recently at a conference where we're talking about document management and, and, the, and how the life cycle of a document, you know, may take 12 hours to completely create, review, refine, and publish this contract. Really? Well, if you can get that down to nine minutes, then that changes your entire business model because you're no longer, it's no longer okay for you to bill hourly. Now you need to figure out like, is it a flat fee system? Is it how, you know, how can this actually now impact your entire business? Because guess what? Your competitors are probably already working on this. Is that thing where the traditionally an hourly lawyer or an attorney, they would put that contract together and then they would bill it out hourly and now it's now it's going to the computer. Yeah, that's the that's AI. kind of that's kind of the idea and the in, in the potentiality. Now the the other side of this, and this is where like I think a lot of people freak out about AI, especially in like in the law firm district or the law firm industry, is um, this thought that I'm going to tell AI to create this document and then it's going to ship it off to the the court and I'm not going to know what it is. I'm just going to be accountable for it. Well. Mm-hmm you always got to check your work. Like there's, oh, there's going to be, you need to be yeah. accountable for it. And and that's, that's where like, you know, courts today now judges are, are saying things like, Hey, if any part of this document is created using artificial intelligence, you need to disclose that at the beginning of the yeah. document. And and so, most courts still allowing it though. Interestingly enough. Um, I think it's probably hit and miss, you know, yeah. there, there's actually a surprising amount of freedom uh, that judges have to be able to say what can, what can and can't happen in my court. Really? Okay. Yeah. So legislature, it's a lot now. It's not as long as it's not like a question of legislature and law and everything. Like they're not they're not playing you know playing full legislature and all that. But they are. But they can dictate and say no. If you're on a Zoom call, I don't want you just using your wireless mic. I want you to be on a landline. You know, and they and so really? they can, yeah they can dictate those things if they want. It's their court and they're they're in charge of that. And so we have to we have to be respectful of that. And and also any any kind of evidence or documents that we produce and we give to somebody, you know, we need to make sure that we're following the guidelines of the person that is, that's going to be receiving it. Makes sense. I, I wonder with the AI, another interesting idea, I'm not sure if it'll, in the terms of logistics, if you keep doing hourly versus the task, but a competitive advantage would be if you have all your attorneys upload all your documents to your specific AI model, or your specific AI tool, well, then the tool will be based on your attorneys. How does that work? Do they all get a royalty? A lot of interesting oh yeah, that's questions a really good asked. question. Yeah, yeah, you can start talking like, uh, especially if you're looking at like intellectual property. Is it, is it using my work as a template? Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's it could be a tool. That, like a, a law firm could have a competitive advantage. Say, hey, we are using AI, but it's because we have the best lawyers fueling the data that goes into the AI to create these new, more efficient, more effective documents and laws. Yeah, I think if we go down that route, I may need you to have a talk with our marketing director. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that's so that's one of those things that that I think is really cool. I think we could probably talk about that for for hours and hours, just kind of going down that road and that possibility. But yeah. like getting back to cybersecurity, you know, we have we have a lot of folks that are doing, or a lot of companies now that are doing log analytics for you know, you've got your sim. Let me let me see you and let me establish what is a normal process. You know, what is oh, yeah. what is abnormal, and, and they're using AI in that in that. 
uh, in that realm, uh, yeah. realm, yeah, to to be able to really kind of understand and identify potential threats. Well, guess what? The bad guys are using AI too, and oh, yeah? they're going to be doing the exact. They're going to be doing the exact same thing in the opposite. And so we need to, just like we talked about, how there is no perfect security posture. We have to constantly be evolving our security posture. And I think looking at emerging technologies using AI needs to be something that we're mindful of. Which is why I say it's always important. You never stop learning when you're in IT. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, the technology is only going to get faster, more advanced. Yep. And it's, it'll be a, always as a tool, but the tool, question is who's going to ye- wield the tool. Well, yeah. And, 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 <laughs> and if you think that there's ever a time where, um, you know, there's the in, the time between the incident happening and the time between you, w- w- the time which you say, oh crap, how yeah. much, hap- how much has happened between there? Exactly. As things get faster, a lot more things are going to be happening between there. Right? Exactly. So yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta stay on top of it as best you can and make sure that you are, uh, you know, you're training your people to be able to identify these things. You're, you're getting in third party resources when needed. Um, you know, and that's, that's where I see a lot of stuff with, or I see a lot of, uh, benefit, especially you talk about pen testing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Rotate who's doing your pen testing Rot- you know, don't just re- rely on one company. And, and oh, I yeah. think there's a lot of folks in the, you know, law firm, you know, we have our own internal initiatives yeah. as far as security initiatives and whatnot go, but, and, and but we also have client re- client um, requirements. And oh, yeah. so our clients will require that we do X, Y, and Z. And guess what? If you like that money that client gives you, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. Exactly. And also you have a cybersecurity insurance. If that company, if your cybersecurity security insurance carrier says you're going to do X, Y, Z, you're going to do X, Y, Z there as well. That's, that's one of the most detrimental things in terms of businesses is the mounting cost of cybersecurity insurance. It just goes up and up and up and the requirements yeah. keep going up and up and up. I mean, eventually there's going to be a breaking point where conceivably companies are just going to roll the dice and self-insure. Again, I'm not giving legal advice, obviously, yeah, no, but it's not. one of those issues where we're talking about cybersecurity. I mean, it's become a whole industry in and of itself. And of course, it's a needed service. You need, I mean, it's always prudent to have cybersecurity insurance, yeah. but it's become so prohibitive. I mean, some of the contracts I've seen, it's some of them are nearly unachievable just based on how they're written. Mm-hmm. Like some of the requirements, I forget what it was, but it was something about an update with Microsoft where it, Microsoft wasn't even complying with it. It's Ouch. like, even if they were doing pr- everything perfectly, it wasn't possible. Yeah. So I had to go back to the cyber insurance company and go, well, here's why we can't do it. It's not possible. We need to rewrite this because not even Microsoft is getting the update that quickly. And I forget, I obviously can't say the logo, but I forget the nuances, but something to that effect where it was outside their control. Yeah. So even though they're doing everything else perfectly, like the automatic reply from the insurance company is no, we're like, well, well, let's have a talk because you're going to get a lot of no's in that case. Yeah. And, and I think that's where you, you really, it needs to be part of a normal cadence to really kind of look at your security posture, understand your attack surface. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot better, even especially like in law firm, reputation's a big deal. Absolutely. And so it's your reputation will, will, will benef- be benefited if you have more of what if conversations than you have the follow-up I should have conversations. Exactly. And so that's, so that's, it really needs to become like a normal cadence, something that is, that is talked about quite a bit. And or we're talked about regularly. What are the threats on the horizon? What are the threats happening right now? You know, how can we, how can we better, how can we better approach this? Well, how can we improve our security posture this month? Like, like it, it really yeah. does need to be, it doesn't, it's not like an annual audit, like an annual audit ain't gonna, isn't going to get you what you want. You no. need to be doing this more regularly than that. Uh, because you're not coming out, the new threats aren't coming out every year. No, <laughs> it's not like a model of a car. It's it's no. it's it's, it's, it's every, minutes. I mean, yeah. it moves so fast, faster yeah. than any other category I've seen. Yeah, and and I'm I always joke about this. I'm a slow leader. I'm a slow reader, mm-hmm. um, but I got to read. Like I, oh, yeah. I need to stay on top of things. I need I need to be aware of things. And so you know, you make sure you're subscribing to to good good sources of information, and make sure you're trying to keep up with that stuff as best as you can. Absolutely. And I mean, it's just going to be more of a value add too when you can talk to your prospective clients, say, hey, not only does our part law firm have the best talent, we have the best attorneys, the best lawyers out there, but we're going to keep all your information under wraps. We're going to keep your confidential information confident because we have some of the best security practices out there as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we always, we have two pillars as far as uh, with, with my team, I always talk about it. We have two things that we're here for. One, we secure and protect the data. And two, we keep the attorneys billing. In other words, we keep exactly. them functioning. Keep the uptime. Keep the uptime. Yep. And, and if, if what we're going to do, or if some project is not, can't fit within those things, we got to rethink it. And, and we've got, but we've got to make sure both of those, there's got to be a balance there. You know, I can, I can make 
the the environment way more secure by shutting off the firewall. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to be able to keep everybody billing <laughs> if there's no <laughs> internet connection. And so you have to you have to establish that balance. You know, there there are certain things that you will have to establish and you have to identify as an accepted known risk. Mm-hmm. Like, I I know that I'm that 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 this is something that needs to be addressed. But if I change it, then you know, like I was saying, I, I, I have to keep the internet connection up. Yeah, exactly. I can't exactly. just shut it off. <laughs> you know, as soon as the business, as soon as 5 p.m., oh, the internet's down, it's yeah. not, that's not gonna work. Um, but, you know, minimize that as much as possible. Understand your your attack vector, your attack surface, and and be able to, you know, pivot and make changes as, as, you, as you can and as you need to. Mm-hmm. And also, understand that your leadership is going to have questions and that they're going to need to justify it. Cause a lot of times, a lot of this stuff's coming down to money. Oh, absolutely. You know, C- you, CFO needs to have a sign off. Yeah, absolutely. And they need to understand and, and they need to have a good grasp of why this thing is important. So this is why it's also really important to never become that person that the boss hates to send you to talk to end users because you may have to go to the CFO and, and yep. say, here's why this is important. Here's, let me, let me, let me help you understand this in a way. Cause I can, you know, if you can translate, if you're, if you're always a good, you can speak the computer and then also speak the human, mm-hmm. um, then, then you're that's, valuable. yeah, that's, that's where, you, that's where you've got to be able, you need to be in that, in that position. And that, that's one of the things that can really help out. And, you know, and I, I know a lot of folks when we talk about career pro- progression, I know a lot of folks that like get into what they're into mm-hmm. and they just want to stay there Yeah, and, and sweet. That's awesome. That's great. I'm really happy that you have that satisfaction in where, in where you're at and what you're doing. And, you know, you need to be able to identify that, especially if you've got someone working on your team like that, that really just like, no, this is what I want to do. Cool. If you, but just make sure that if there's something, you know, have a relationship enough with that person to say, Hey, if you ever become unsatisfied Mm -hmm. or you feel like you're going to get burned out, come talk to me. If we need to make a change, come talk to me. And the more you invest in someone like that, the more they're going to have that fulfillment in their job. And so they're going to want to stay on and, and, and having that kind of positive person, that positive attitude in a role, um, it's not going to offset every negative or toxic thing that rolls into the day, but right. it's going to help out quite a bit. Absolutely. You always want to keep them hungry, keep them learning. Cause even if you want to quote unquote, you know, just do one category of let's say networking. Yeah. I mean, there's still faster, oh, more yeah. secure network, especially with security these days. I yeah. mean, there's always evolutions and new category, new ideas when it comes to networking. I mean, it's fascinating to see the trends of all of a sudden, oh, oh my gosh. This company's come out of nowhere. Now they got some interesting technology. They put an AI into their wireless access points. That's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. And of course, before you know it, they're bought out by one of the big three manufacturers. Yeah. But nevertheless, yeah. it's well. I mean, even <laughs> but even there are still stories of you know we talk about the hardware. Um, there there are some some big gorillas in the room when it comes to hardware. You know, oh, yeah. you're always going to have the HPEs. You're always going to have Dells. You're going to have all right. this. And you know, twenty years ago, I mean, NetApp was taking ownership. It seemed like of storage. Oh yeah. And you need, I don't really see them. I haven't kept up with them as much now, but man, look at pure pure is coming up. Oh yeah. They've got some fantastic technologies and they're really, they're really kind of putting the screws to some folks. Oh, it's lightning fast. Yeah. I mean, they, they may have not invented the category of all flash Santa Ray, but they, they darn near perfected it. Yeah. I've never once heard a single person complain about pure storage. Yeah. That, and, with the exception of price. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it's performed so phenomenal. Well, and, and so the, but we have to be aware of that. Like we have to, yeah. obviously you can't follow every horse in the race, oh, but, yeah. but you know, understand that, Hey, you may be dealing with that technology one day. So at least know what it is. Exactly. And, and that, that kind of goes across the, just goes across the full board. Is it, you know, Meraki, if Meraki eventually ended up getting bought by, by Cisco. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sure. But you know, understand what Meraki has, what their kind of model is, understand what these concepts are, because you know you may need to go and have a conversation where we're talking about strategy for the next three to five years. Mm. Well, that may not be the same um, manufacturer uh, finger or footprint that you've got in your environment today. Things may change. Absolutely. You know, and so you always want to be learning. You always want to kind of understand what's out there and where 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 shifts in the industry are going, because. Like, like with Pure, like with uh, Meraki, you know, a lot of things, there there really are some very, very nice um, applications for that technology and environments today. Absolutely. And I was going to say, in terms of helping the end user, Meraki was pretty darn near perfect. I mean, they had it to such a point where anyone could deploy it. It was such an intuitive technology. It was so great for a myriad of applications. I'm not surprised they required. I mean, that was probably yeah. one of the best acquisitions in IT history in terms of a great product and rolling into your portfolio. Now they, you know, they got all the other myriad of products with the software thrown on there. Mm-hmm. That was pretty good. I don't know if Cisco will make any money on this plug, but the, the yeah. Rocky <laughs> yeah. was a good one. Yeah, the, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is interesting. And, and I think as, as time goes by, we are going to see a little bit more kind of, 
it's not going to, I want to say mom and pop shops, but we're going to see a lot, a little bit more companies coming up in the industry that are going to be offering and whether or not they get bought, I don't know, but they're, they're going to be coming with new ideas and new approaches. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to have an idea of what that is because that is, is not, not necessarily reshaping, but it is opening up our future in the industry as well, because we need to understand, you know, like I, we talk about the auto industry and, and how, you know, GM may eventually just be a tech company because because of all the technology going into their vehicles. I test drove a, a new Silverado at the State Fair of Texas this year, and oh, really? there was some setting on on the on the uh, dash console there where you know you hit a button and it for cameras, and yeah. all of a sudden you look at it and it's got a bird's eye view of the truck you're in, and yeah. so, so they're they're melting in and they're like they're they're kind of stitching together all the video feeds from the cameras all over this vehicle. And it's like, man, that is a fantastic technology. I really hope that it, you know, that, that catches on that really latches on, you know, and we, so we talk about them becoming more technologically driven, uh, no, no pun on that one, oh, yeah. uh, but, <laughs> <I'll take it. laughs> but when you talk about them becoming more of a tech company, because that's where they're, they're kind of, that's what the CEO wants. Mary Barrows said it out loud. Okay. Like, oh yeah. Well, like, there so you can, go. Can, again, this could change in a New York minute, but Cadillac will be full EV by 2030 GM whole fleet. So that includes Buick, GMC, Chevrolet, as well as Cadillac. They'll all be EV by twenty thirty five. Okay, that's what again. That's what they're claiming. Yeah, well, I think that's and they, I think that's a very cool idea. You know, yeah. and I, I think so long as we've got the charging infrastructure to back that up, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, but but we but we need to understand like what does that look like for the for two generations from now of the people building these things? Oh yeah, you know it's it's going to be change. It's going to be life changing and lifestyle changing for a lot of folks. You know, and 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 we we have the same thing here in IT. Oh yeah. With if you look at Meraki and you look at the 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 needs for setting up a Meraki switch versus like a old Cisco 4506 or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's night and day, you know, you've oh, got yeah. a web GUI. Well, you got to know these th 300 commands, you know, and then, and, oh, yeah. and so, but you have <laughs> over time, you know, you've got people growing up in the technology, but you just can't get locked in completely. This is all I'm ever going to do now, unless you're two years from retirement, you're two years from retirement. You sure. stick, you stick to your guns. God bless <laughs> yeah. you. You've laid out a foundation that we are thankful for. Yep. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we have to, if, especially if you're getting into IT or you're trying to advance in IT, learn stuff, be open to learning things, never stop learning. That's really, that that's key to success. That's, that's the key to success. Cause the one guarantee in life is that there will be change, yep. especially in technology. I mean, there's, there's certain categories that are life or certain products where you can make, you can make the fair debate. Like the manufacturing process might change, but the product itself hasn't changed too much. I mean, Anecdotally speaking, just think off the top of my head, perhaps like a revolver that's been around for over, well over 100 years. Mm -hmm. 1911 has been around for over years, which I was going to say, if no one know, doesn't know what that is, look up John Moses Browning. He's a brilliant mechanical engineer. Yeah. But most of the products we see all around us, they change dramatically over time. Yeah. And it's because of technology. The process yeah. is... It may still be recognizable. Yeah. But it's it's quite different. Exactly. You know, and obviously we're not. It's not just a gun talk. But I mean, if you look at you look at uh, something even as beautiful as a 1911, then you compare it to like a Glock. Oh yeah. You know the the it's recognizable. You understand it. You could probably figure out what all the parts are. Mm -hmm. But you start taking it apart, and things are going to look very different. Oh, exactly. And so, but it's. So you need to be flexible enough to understand, like, I'm not just going to be, you know, I, I, you know, I like my 1911. I like that yeah. technology. It's just perfect. There's nothing else I need to change. Well, <laughs> try something. That's, that's totally fine. Um, try, for, for try staccato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just understand that there's going to be advancements across the board, no matter where, no matter where you're at. But, you know, so you're always want to just always keep learning. I was going to say, speaking of 1911, what do you like to do outside the office? Um, well, 1911 is that's what oh, we were talking about that earlier. That's, that was my first handgun purchase. Um, I do enjoy shooting shooting. I enjoy hunting. Um, uh, I don't, you know, like with most hobbies, I don't think I do it enough. Yep. Uh, but I also do a lot of, I do woodworking. Uh, oh, really? What kind? Know. Um, mostly, uh, kind of structural stuff. So I like, I love, I love going in and my, our family motto is if it's worth building, it's worth overbuilding. And so yep. like when my kids wanted a tree house, well, that's fine. So now they've got an eight by 12, uh, tree house that's kind of attached to a tree but it's oh, really? really it's really a cabin up on stilts and so and that's awesome yeah well and and uh, yeah i love doing that i love being able to t take it you know especially i think this may be maybe an offset from my it career is you don't always like get a feeling like i built this with my hands when you're behind a keyboard because it's a lot of software oriented yeah a lot <laughs> yeah. of it is and yeah. and virtualization is like it's hard yeah. to, hard to look at that and go it's tangible but yeah um 
yeah, no, so I know. So I love to, I love to build things with my hands. Um, I love doing yard work surprisingly. Yeah. Like I've never felt like such an old man as to when I say <laughs> I love doing yard work, but I mean, there's, there's no more honest work than working in your own yard. Absolutely. Like, put pride into it too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just throw out, you know, throw something out get you, put you a border around something, clean up, clean up, make the soil healthier, grow something yeah. like all of that. I love that idea. And, it, and it's, but it also, it's all lessons in patience as well, because oh, very true. When, I'm, when I'm working, I delete something or I, or I spend something up, it's there immediately. Oh, if I'm trying yeah. to, yeah, if I'm trying to grow something, oh my, I, or build six, something. Yeah. Six to nine weeks till I, what germinate? Yeah. I'm not going to know if it even germinates for 17 days. That's ridiculous. Like how long do you take to build a tree house or the pseudo tree house? It sounds like yeah. a cabin. Does it have a shingle roof and everything? Uh, it's got a steel roof. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, yeah, it's got a single slant steel roof and it's got a little wraparound staircase that gets up to it. And it's yeah. got a front porch and yeah, I mean, like I said, if it's worth building, it's worth overbuilding. And, uh, uh, but I mean, it's still standing today. It took me probably, I want to say I worked on that for about a month and that That's was, cool. yeah. And that was a lot of time that was me going out and my, my neighbors that are close enough to hear me probably hate me for this, but like I, I'd, I'd go out at, you know, nine o'clock at night, put the kids to bed, then go fire up the work light and just go start digging holes to put the post in. And then, yep. you know, I'd start, you know, you'd hear the, you'd hear my impact driver going at two in the morning <laughs> just cause I had, I can't sleep. Might as well go work on that thing. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it becomes a labor of love. You know, it's something you just really, you just really enjoy. And, and, you know, I go sit out on my front or I go sit on my back porch now and I can, and I just, you know, look out through the woods and see the tree house back down in there. And I see, you know, birds and birds, you know, listen to the birds and, and I always tell people that you need, you should always start your day with bird song and end your night with crickets. Yeah. You know, I like and, it. And just, just find some time to settle down and rest. I think that's something we kind of disconnected from in terms of modern society. Like we used to make, especially the United States, we used to be the manufacturing mecca of the world, especially after World War II. And I mean, there's a certain pride of making something with your hands that it just feels different when you're working. Like most people they, today, it's a service oriented economy. You're doing a lot of work on a computer. Like one of those things I took the most pride in was building these tables. And I mean, it was 150 year old antique, you know, barn wood, got a lot of epoxy. I mean, these two tables, seven feet by four feet, they took about a year. Mm. But it's because we can only work on it, you know, once a week on Sunday when I was hanging out with my proof point buddy. Yep. But it's one of those things where like, I'll never throw these away. No. Like they just they mean the world to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. My uh my well, I guess it's like ten years ten, about ten years ago now for Christmas, my wife wanted a dining room set. Mm. Our dining room in our house was this was is this really odd shape and size and so we couldn't find one on the market that really fit into the room well and so i was like okay so i'll just build one and so um drew up something she's like yep that sounds good and so that was her biggest christmas present that year was i built her a dining room set that's and, awesome. you know, we're still eating off of it today. And that, on the way. Well, that's, and that's the, that's kind of the other beauty of it is like right now I need to fix something on it, but I know how to fix it. Cause I put it together in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can, I can kind of, kind of take a little joy in that. Now, if she listens to this, she's going to wonder why I still haven't fixed it yet. But, <laughs> so we won't bring that up too deeply, but we'll publish it in a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the, just the kind of that, that joy you get, you know, when you finally have something tangible or, and you finally, you know, you you start feeling the heft of something that you're moving. Like I, I don't even want it. I, I'm looking at the epoxy on this, and I don't know how heavy these tables are, but I bet they're not light. Uh, not as bad as you'd think. Mainly just awkward to carry. Okay. But yeah, as uh, lessons learned, we would, you know, we pour. It turns out, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but the worst material to work with for epoxy tables is antique barred wood because they're so oh, porous. Geez. Yeah. So we would do a layer. Bubbles would come up. We'd hit them with the hair dryer. Bubbles would come up again overnight. So if you look at the side of it, it's about equal parts in terms of the thickness, equal parts wood and epoxy. Okay. But we, we finished it. Gosh, darn it. Yeah. It looks and fantastic. I appreciate it. Yeah. I got back when American money was real. We actually got real <laughs> silver coins in there. I think mostly from the 1800s in terms of the dates, of the coins. Yeah. And it's one of those things where, you know, just one day a week, just slowly, but surely got to see it come together. A lot of troubleshooting, just trying to find the material allocation was a good challenge. Cause I want to make hundred percent made in the USA. Yeah. It's like trying to find the right screws. And I was going to say, should we, for how many times we went to Home Depot, should we ask for a sponsorship? Like it was like a couple of times a month to just going to Home Depot to get more materials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really recommend, and this again is not a plug for Home Depot, but I definitely recommend getting a pro account. Um, yes. To, I should have done see, that. So you can track that. Um, I started that a few years ago and I think I, I mean, I'm only spent, I'm not, I'm, it's a drop in the bucket for them, but oh, yeah. like the fact that it, like once a quarter I get a $50 gift card and I was like, oh, that's cool. Oh yeah. But yeah, no, we just, uh, we just finished remodeling a bathroom upstairs for my boys. And, oh, cool. uh, yeah. And so I got, I was able to go in and, and 
had to demo everything and reframe and replumb and, and replace all the electrical outlets and all that stuff. And I hired, oh some, I hired an expert to do the tile because like, I don't want to learn on that in an upstairs yeah. bathroom. And I could just imagine everything falling through the ceiling. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I just, that's, that's our latest project. So just really a lot of kind of hands-on stuff around the house. We, we joke about like, growing up kind of dirt poor of like, we didn't, we never had the opportunity to hire someone else to do something. So we just like, we would, me and my dad would collect skills like stamps, like, like, yep. Oh, yep. Nope. Nope. I know how to do that now. I'm never yeah. doing it again, but I know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever want to work on cars again? Oh yeah. 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 No. And, and I, like I said, I still have my truck in the driveway that I need to, I've started, I, I've got to replace the timing chain on it right now, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I, I love working on that stuff. It's just finding the time. You know, that, you got it. You got true. it. The, we, we always talk about with my dad, like getting together and doing stuff. It's like, we don't, we don't have, I know you guys don't have time for this. No, we don't have time for anything. We have to make time for it. <laughs> exactly. We have to designate. This is the time we're going to work on this. You, make, so, you yeah. make the time for the things that matter most. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you can re restore again, cost is, don't, it, it's, you got sponsored by the Home Depot or something like that. If you can restore yeah. or I guess maybe, what was, what was it? AutoZone uh, or something. AutoZone, something yeah. like that. Yeah. If you can restore any vehicle, what would you want to choose? Uh, it's my dad's. He has a 1965 Mustang. Oh really? Yeah, it's got. Nice. Um, I think is it three. So I think it's just shy of four thousand actual miles. That's it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a muse That's darn near museum quality. That's and, insane. and it's yeah. So they, there's a little bit of the engine that needs to be updated, but it's got red leather interior. It was that. It was that. What, what color is the outside? Uh, it's that kind of that off white cream color. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was, it, it was one of the options there on 65. It's got the bolt on air conditioner inside. It's, it's a beautiful oh, right. car. And, yeah. and if, and, and I really, um, I, it was, it was one of the times probably, I think I was probably about 10 or 12 and, uh, we were driving it around just cause we had just changed, changed the brakes out and got new tires on it just as maintenance. And, um, we're driving around and he's like, here, let me tell you why they used to call these things muscle cars. And I was like, what? And he shifts into third gear and we're already going like 30 miles an hour. He shifts into third gear and he barks the tires. Oh yeah. And I was like, and you know, sucked into the seat <laughs> and it was like, oh my gosh, you know, you realize now you're in a, you know, 3000 pound car that's got this V8 engine that could really, really rot, you know, really rattle you. Oh yeah. Um, but it's, but it's, you know, it's all still original. Everything's still original. It just, oh, really? it's, it's, yeah. Um, and so there's not a lot to restore on it, but mm -hmm. it, but you know, everything just needs to be cleaned up. Oh yeah. And so I think because to him, that's a project that it's one of his someday deals. Like I'd get to it at some point. Mm -hmm. And so I think if I could just restore one thing, it'd probably be that just so that he could, he could know that everything is done and kind of, kind of mark that one off. That'd be awesome. I mean, yeah. that, that was peak muscle car back in the day. Yeah, it was a beauty. It's it's such a it, you know we we ended up getting it. We inherited it from a friend yeah. that she really did just go drive it to the grocery store a few miles down the road every yeah. Sunday, and that was it. Oh my gosh! Um, and stayed in her garage. It's still in the garage today. Same garage. We in, oh, no way. So, yeah, <laughs> and so, um, but it's just a it's a it's a beautiful car, and it's just one of those things where you look at it and go, man, this is. It, you know, when we were still putting style and engineering into things, oh yeah, it wasn't all just about aerodynamics because you yeah. know you start, efficiency, yeah, it wasn't all government the, mandates. Well, I mean, yeah, the there's, there's that too. But like <laughs> even you know, if you look at uh, today, you look at a Lamborghini and a Ferrari and even a Corvette now with the 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 mid engine mm. Corvettes, all these Corvette, yeah. Well, I mean, you you look at them and it's like it takes you a minute to actually figure out what brand that is because. Yeah. You know, once you get, and for a while, like the Viper, the Viper and the yeah. Corvette were nearly identical. It seemed like, because once you got so aerodynamic, you really, there's not going to be a lot of uniqueness to it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, back then we had so much character in things and we had so much pride in that, you know, and you would see, you know, this part with this, this car was manufactured in this state, in this city by this team, you know, oh, yeah. and that kind of, you could track that kind of stuff. Well, there, it was a lot more incentive. Well, there's so much risk when any car company comes out with a new model. It's a billion dollar gamble. And that's why I think a lot of cars look so similar because if it's too different, it might not sell. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where back in the day, I mean, look at the car names back in the day. They were very, very much more unique. Yeah. For and sure. I mean, the old school muscle cars are just peak Americana. I mean, and what I love about that, I mean, you, anyone can fix them back in the day. Oh, yeah. Which also perhaps, you know, well, was, you, yeah. yeah, you open the hood and you can sit on the inner fender and, yeah. and, and have your feet dangling around the engine while you're working on it. Yeah, yeah that, that was, that was 
that yeah you need every, a computer had, for it had a shade tree mechanic and was able to go and you know do everything you needed to you just you had to know the guy in the neighborhood that could help you out with that yeah it, it's killing me that gm is killing the, the great v8s like when my i met someone at the track a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago actually and he had the new well it's gonna be gone next year it'll be an suv but he had the camaro zl1 and on the, you got a nice little placard on the engine says you know handmade in usa and it's just there's a certain craft that's cars still get attention for but it's becoming less and less of a thing it's becoming more rare because again it's a risk it's more of a niche i mean the most popular cars these days are crossovers suvs and trucks yep. so it's one of those things where sports cars are slowly becoming less and less of a, a volume of all overall sales yeah it'll be interesting to see how long they could stick around i mean thankfully we still have like the original masa miata still rocking pretty good i mean that's <laughs> they found their niche i mean yeah. consumers love that vehicle but even the corvette i mean to me the controversy was one moving the engine which you could debate that's what Neil Zora wanted back in the day in the seventies and sixties. But I mean, now it's almost like a computer because it's automatic transmission only. And now they even have an, uh, a hybrid then they'll eventually have a electric Corvette. Yep. So you have all the automotive companies slowly becoming more computer companies. It's, it's really fascinating. Yeah. And, the, and I think we, we've talked about this earlier where, you know, every company is an IT company, whether they realize it yet or not. Exactly. Uh, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're all, we're all moving to there. You know, eventually you're going to have just a car podcast that you talk about. IT, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, the, uh, that's, that's another one that we could probably run off on a tangent. You know, my, my, uh, two of my in-laws both own new Broncos. Oh, really? And I really, I think, I think that's a really nice design on the Bronco. And then when the, oh, yeah. when the blazer showed up and I was like, that's not a blazer. No, I mean, <laughs> the Bronco was a billion, that was a huge risk by Ford, but they knocked it out of that park. I mean, consumers yeah. loved it for the three people who want it like me they sell some manual transmission if you want yeah. it from the factory i mean yep. it had enough of the styling where it's still true to the original design but made it you know updated a little bit it's hard to find that balance but they really did not get out of the park with that vehicle yeah yeah absolutely and that's i think that's probably a good it might be a good place to land the plane there where we talk about because yep. <laughs> we everything is still recognizable but the insides are very very different uh, exactly so <laughs> that's i think i think that for as as far as it advice on career progression is understand that that you're going to be meeting the same needs mm -hmm. throughout your entire career but the way that you're doing that and the and the the technology and the medium you're using that in that are, are going to evolve so absolutely just be ready to evolve with it Agreed. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to tune in today. Don't forget to take time to click that like button and subscribe button. Leave a comment as well. Also, don't forget to take time to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone. Just stay safe and have a great day.